God, you are good. God, you are good. God, you are good. God, you are good. I need help. 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 So do they. So do they. So do they. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whatever campus you might be watching from today in San Antonio or Fredericksburg, we're so grateful that you're a part of this special service in which we are exploring your best 10 minutes. A series on prayer for those of us who struggle to pray. It seems to me that the whole Bible can be reduced down into a simple sentence. And as we spend a few minutes each day with this sentence, then we find those minutes to be our best 10 minutes. That prayer is going to appear on the screen. I'd like to invite you to say the prayer out loud with me. You ready? God, you are good. I need help. So do they. Thanks. Prayer, as we discussed last week, begins with the goodness of God. The goodness of God is revealed in this very simple truth, and that is, He is our Father. He calls Himself our Abba, our Daddy. And you affirm this truth when you take some minutes every day to state simply, You're my Daddy. I want you to know that I researched this sermon on an elementary school playground. I'm familiar with playgrounds. I'm a, I'm a veteran of playgrounds. There was a time when I could generate a spin on the merry-go-round that would last for three minutes. My brother and I would wrap our legs around the bars and lie on our backs and let our heads hang off the ledge and I'm surprised we didn't spew our breakfast. It was a thrill that was a lot better than Disney and, and much cheaper. I know my way around, around playgrounds and the swing set. Oh, the swing set. The one in our hometown was taller than our courthouse, or so it seemed, and and we would swing high enough to look over the roofs of the neighborhoods, lean back and feel your stomach jump. Here comes that breakfast again. (laughs) And so I know my way around playgrounds, but that day I wasn't on the playground to spin or to swing. I went there on serious business. I went there to research. And I took my research staff, which consists of me and my alter ego, me. (laughs) And we sought to answer this question. How do kindergartners respond at the sight of their daddy? When a five-year-old spots Papa in the parking lot, how does he or she react? What's that? You already know the answer to that question. You could have saved me the trip. I didn't have to do the research. You've already seen that. You know how a child responds when a child sees daddy? Then you know one of the core principles about prayer. And whatever you see in the heart or the face of a child, when a child sees a father, that's exactly what God longs to see in your heart and mine when we pray. God invites us to call him Daddy. In history's most famous prayer, Jesus taught us to begin our prayer by saying, Our Father in heaven. More specifically, our Abba in heaven. Abba was a tender, intimate, everyday term. It was the warmest of the Aramaic words for Father. It was literally Daddy or Papa. 
Formality stripped away, proximity promised. Jesus, in this prayer, invites us to come to God in prayer like a child comes to his or her papa, which takes me back to the playground. I did take some notes. I found a spot on the bench under the awning, and I flipped open a notebook. And the kids were being released from school, and I wrote down every emotion I saw And I wrote down as many phrases as I could write. Here they are in no particular order. Yippee! That was screamed by a red-headed boy wearing a Batman backpack when he saw his daddy. Ice cream! Apparently a promise had been made by a silver-haired grandma in a SUV to a freckle-faced girl. Pop, over here, push me! little boy wearing a Boston Red Sox hat had scooted straight to the swings. The father laughed at the sight of his playful kid. Good for you, Dad. Then one boy said this, Daddy, can Tommy come home with me? His mom is on a business trip and he doesn't want to hang out with his big sister because she doesn't want to let him watch TV and she makes him... He never stopped talking. (laughs) His mouth was an open water hydrant. I heard requests, I heard excitement, I heard questions. We going home? I heard a whole lot of this. Mommy, Daddy. But here's what I did not hear. Dear Father, (laughs) it is most gracious of Thee to drive Thy car to my place (laughs) of education and provide me with domestic transportation. As you have stated to me in the first epistle to me, please know of my deepest gratitude, for thou art splendid in thy attentive care and diligent in thy dedication. I didn't hear formality. I didn't hear impressive vocabulary. I just saw and heard kids who were, by and large, happy to see their folks I say by and large because that kid on the swing set really threw a fit when his dad told him it was time to leave. (laughs) But my question is this. How does their response at the side of their daddy compare to your response when you talk to yours? Has it been a while Honestly, has it been a while since you spoke to your daddy who is in heaven? This term takes aim at our pride. You see, other salutations permit a sense of sophistication. As a pastor, I know this well. I just can deepen the tone of my voice and I can pause for dramatic effect when I call God, O Holy King. And I can allow those words to reverberate around the universe and just present myself as the great pontiff of petition. I elevate myself, I tend to elevate myself when I give God a title. But it is hard to show off when you call God Daddy. It's just hard to be pompous when you call God your Papa. Perhaps this is the point. Perhaps the first purpose of prayer, a Daddy prayer, is to define the roles. He's the father and I'm a child. He's a father and I'm a child. Before I'm a soldier in the faith, before I'm a saint, before I'm a priest, before I'm anything I might aspire to be, I'm a kid. And he's my father. Jesus said, unless you are converted and become as what? Little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The first prerequisite to enter the kingdom of heaven 
is to be like the kid on the playground. Forget greatness, seek littleness, trust more, strut less. Make lots of requests and gladly accept all of his gifts. But don't use prayer as a stage for self-promotion. Jesus said it this way. He said, when you pray, don't be like hypocrites. They love to stand in the synagogues and on the street corners and pray so people will see them. I'll tell you the truth, they already have their full reward. Religious leaders loved, and they still love, to make a theater out of their prayers. They perch themselves in intersections and, and practice their piety publicly. The show nauseated Jesus. He said, when you pray, you should go into your room and close the door and pray to your Father who cannot be seen. And your Father who, sees, who can see what is done in secret your father can see what is done in secret, and he will reward you. Now, these words would have stunned the audience of Jesus. You see, God, they believed, met with special people in a special place. He spoke to the priest, and not just to the priest, but to some special priests among the priesthood in the temple, in a special place, the Holy of Holies. Prayer was reserved for them. They, the audience of Jesus, these were, these were stonecutters. These were farmers. These were people of the land and earth. They, they couldn't enter the temple. But Jesus said, you can enter your closet. Go to your room, he said, and close the door. Interesting. In Palestinian culture, the room most likely to have a door was the storage room. Your house has doors everywhere, but most simple Palestinian homes only had one room that had a door, and that was where they stored the farm tools, the, the feed, the seed. I mean, a chicken might wander in and wander out. Nothing impressive. It was nothing holy. It was just the day-to-day -day room. It still is. I don't know about you, but my closet is nothing fancy. It has no fancy fixtures or impressive furniture. It has shoe rack and hangers and dirty clothes basket and drawers for socks and underwear. I don't entertain guests in the closet. You'll never hear me tell visitors after dinner, hey, let's all step into the closet for a chat. <laughs> Deanlin and I prefer the living room or the den. God apparently, listen, God likes to chat in the closet. He's low on fancy, in other words. He's high on accessibility. No chapel necessary, no cathedral required. If you want to go to the Vatican for prayer, go ahead, but prayers of home carry as much weight as prayers of Rome. Why? Because the one who hears them is your your daddy, your papa. So you don't have to woo him with location, nor do you have to wow him with eloquence. Jesus said, and when you pray, don't be like those people who don't know God. They continue saying things that mean nothing, thinking that God will hear them because of their many words. Don't be like them, because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. Interesting. Jesus, when he teaches about prayer, actually downplays the importance of words. No other religion does this. Every other religion, when it comes to prayer, places the emphasis on the right words and the abundance of words. Jesus, by contrast, place, places the emphasis on the one who hears the prayer and the heart that says the prayer. Muslim prayers are very impressive. However, they must be properly recited at each of the five appointed times during the day. 
Hindu and Buddhist prayers are very profound, yet they depend upon the proper repetition of mantras and sounds and words and syllables as if the power of the prayer lies in the recital of the prayer. The religion of humanism wouldn't say that it promotes prayer, but it really does. It's the prayer of self-talk, positive thinking. I can do this. And if I use the right language and prop myself up with the right words and enough words, but still it depends upon my words. Even certain branches of the Christian faith highlight correct prayer language or the proper prayer chant or the latest prayer trend or the holiest prayer terminology. Against all this emphasis on syllables and chatter, Jesus says, don't be like the people who use many words. You see, with God, it's not the quantity, but it's the sincerity that matters. We parents get this. It doesn't take many words from our kids to go straight to a parent's heart. When my oldest daughter, Jenna, was 13 years old, she flubbed her piano recital. Jenna went on to become a very good pianist and a really great singer, but everyone has an off day, and she just happened to have her off day in front of a crowded room of family and friends and onlookers. She started well. Her fingers flowed up and down the keyboard like Liberace. I was so proud. But midway through the piece, it's just like her musical train jumped off the track. I can still see her in my memory staring straight ahead, looking at something, trying to find that piece of music that she had memorized somewhere in her memory. No luck. For the life of her, she couldn't remember the next part. And the silence in the auditorium was broken only by the pounding of our hearts. Boom, 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 boom. Come on, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. Try it again. It will come. And finally it did. That mental block broke and Jenna completed the piece. But by then the damage was done. And she stood up from the piano bench at the end of the song and her chin was quivering and, and she curtsied. And, the audience offered that polite applause. She hurried off the stage. She didn't even go to sit back down. She hurried off the stage and she wanted to get out of the auditorium. And Deanlin and I scurried out of our seats and we met her at the side of the auditorium. She threw her arms around me. And you know what she said? She said, oh, daddy. And that's all it took. That's all it took. She could have asked me for anything in the world at that moment. I would have done it. <laughs> I was a sucker. I was wide open. I was vulnerable. I was going to, if a hug could have squeezed the hurt out of her body, that hug would have done it. And all it took was one word. Sometimes, friend, one word is all you have. And sometimes life is so hard and the day is so long. The pressure is so abundant. Sometimes all you can muster is, oh, my daddy in heaven. And that's all it takes. That's all it takes. What relief this brings. You see, prayers, prayers are not graded according to style. God does not dismiss your request because it was poorly worded. The right heart cannot pray wrong. Now, the wrong heart can pray wrong. But the right heart, the heart that wants a daddy in heaven, 
You may stumble and fumble on your words. But don't get caught up in making sure you say the words in a certain way. Listen, as we unpack this prayer over the next few weeks, we're going to come to God with some major requests. We're going to ask Him to heal us. We're going to ask Him to encourage us. We're going to ask Him to lead us. We're going to ask Him to pardon us. We're going to beg for Him to pour out mercy on the whole planet. The last thing we need is to be worried about the right words. We just need to keep the right relationship. We just need to begin by talking to God because He's good and because He's our Father. If the power of prayer depends upon the one who hears, I'm sorry, if the power of prayer depends upon the one who offers the prayer, I'm sunk. But if the power of prayer depends upon the one who hears the prayer, we have hope. Why? Because the one who hears our prayer is our Papa. So, Here's my encouragement. Try this. Take the posture of a child. Take the posture of a child. When you pray, just find a quiet corner and take a seat. Press the pause button on your life and bow your head or get on your knees or look up to heaven, whatever posture works best for you. But come with the posture of a child. And just say these words. God, I just want you to know you're good. And I also want you to know that you're my daddy. Some of you need a papa prayer more than others. And the reason is because your daddy was anything but. The role of a daddy in a family is to protect, to provide, and to promote. To protect the family from harm, to provide the family with the basic needs, and to promote the kids. Oh, you did a great job. You're such a good kid. I hope you grew up with that kind of daddy. But I know that some of you did not. Your daddy let himself get lost in his work or get lost in life or get lost in some addiction or get lost on a prodigal path. And so when you think of talking to God as your daddy, there's not an image there that comes quickly. In fact, the image that comes may be a painful one. Here's what I encourage you to do. First of all, know that God knows. Know that He knows. He knows what your daddy did. He knows what your daddy did not do. He knows. So secondly, just say, God, help me. I don't have a picture of a daddy. Would you be the daddy for me that I never had? Now, friend, that's a prayer that your heavenly Father is so ready to answer. Because you were made to have a father's love. And he will be the daddy to you that you never had. You'll find in your prayer that there are some days that you never get beyond this phrase. That you say, oh God, you're good. And you think about his goodness for a few moments. You think about how kind he is, the provisions that he's made. And then you say, oh God, you're my daddy. And that healing word will go so deep in your spirit that the spirit himself will be stitching together some torn fabric in your soul that needs to be healed. And so there will be days that your prayer goes no farther than that, and that's okay. Because the power of prayer never lies in the one who says the prayer, but in the one who hears it. Amen? God says, I will be a father to you, and you will be 
my sons and daughters. So, call God your Abba. The Heidelberg Catechism asks, why has Christ commanded us to call God our Father? The answer, that immediately at the beginning of our prayer, he might excite in us a childlike reverence for and confidence in God, which are the foundations of prayer. St. Teresa of Avila said that she found it difficult to move beyond the phrase, Our Father in Heaven. It was to her a lovely land she never wanted to leave. It will be the same to you, my friend. Take the posture of a child. Climb up in his lap. Tell him everything that's on your heart or tell him nothing at all. But most of all, just call him your father. And so, dear Lord, dear King, dear Master, that's exactly what we do. Father, some of us have a difficult time in calling you Daddy because of our pride. We're sophisticated. We're accomplished. It's been a long time since we called anyone Daddy. But dear Lord, we need a Daddy. And we pray that you'd grant us the heart of a child. And we pray that you would take the role, Father, in our hearts that you want to, and that is a provider, a promoter, and a protector. We welcome you, Lord, to do that work within us. And we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Stand up, will you? I bet you'd like to spend a few moments speaking now to your Abba, Father.